Professor David Begun, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup all the way from Toronto, Canada. You are a paleoanthropologist and paleoprimatologist based in the University of Toronto, researching the evolution of the lineages of great apes and humans. Only last month, August 2023, news of the discovery of a new fossil ape, the 8 million year old Andaluvius Turque, hit the headlines supporting your hypothesis that the ancestors of African apes and humans evolved in Europe before migrating to Africa. So how are you doing, David? Um, things must be pretty intense for you since the release of this new hypothesis. You've just come back from another trip to Turkey. Um, this must be an exciting time for you. Well, thanks for having me, first of all, Mark. It is it is very exciting. Um, it's, it isn't really a new hypothesis though. It's just a, a new fossil that we used to test a hypothesis that I've published before about uh, where the ancestors of uh, African apes and humans originated. Um, so we use these, this new fossil from, from Turkey to test that hypothesis by adding it to uh, the analysis, a phylogenetic analysis that we had done previously, see how it came out. And it turns out that it does support the hypothesis that I've been publishing for some time now. Before we get into the fascinating world of the ancestors of our ancestors, let's just hear a little bit about your background. David, did you always have an interest in science and in particular, human origins? I've always been interested in science. Um, I took all the science courses I could in high school. And uh, uh, and in fact, when I first went to college, I was enrolled in a pre-med program. That was as much something I wanted to do as something my father wanted me to do. But uh, after I took my first anthro course, I realized that uh, that I wanted to do human origins research. Uh, I grew up halfway, half the time in the U.S. and half the time in France. And the area in which I grew up in France is a prehistory area. It's the Dordogne region where famous sites like Lascaux and Comagnon and Le Moustier are located. And I visited those cave sites when I was a kid with my grandparents. And I think probably that's that was influential in scientific uh, pursuit. And so I even changed universities to go to one that was uh, stronger in paleoanthropology. Yeah, and uh, that's kind of how it started. <laughs> You're the author of The Real Planet of the Apes, a book which details your hypothesis that our ancestors evolved in Europe before migrating to Africa. David, what is the story of this incredible migration? Well, it begins maybe 20 million years ago or so in East Africa, where the earliest apes uh, are, are, first, uh, are, are first known, or at least where they, they're preserved in sufficient, uh, with sufficient quality and quantity so that we can analyze them and understand them. There were apes, the best known one is, was an ape called Ekembo, which lived, uh, mainly it's known from Kenya. Uh, and from that ape we know, and from other ones like it, we know that these apes were more monkey-like than ape-like. If you saw one in the tree, you would say, that's a strange looking monkey because it doesn't have a tail. And that was one of the things that distinguishes Ekembo from monkeys and tells us that it is an ape. There are also some subtle uh, characters, especially in the hips and the wrists, but really it's they don't have a tail, they have a, a tail bone, you know, a coccyx is, as it's known in, in, in anatomy, uh, but they don't have a tail. Uh, and proconsul was, I mean, Ekembo, sorry, we used to call it proconsul and I slip into it every once in a while. Ekembo um, was monkey-like, it scampered about in the trees, running on the tops of branches, eating soft fruits. Um, and a little bit after Ekembo, at around 17 and a half million years ago, we get a new kind of thing a new animal, a new primate, a new ape um, that has very large jaws and teeth, especially powerful chewing muscles, quite different looking from Akembo. You can easily tell them apart. And we think that this ape, which is called Afropithecus, 
was able to exploit a wider range of uh, dietary resources than Ikembo, and therefore it could disperse across larger areas of the landscape, exploiting resources on the ground, for example, or harder, tougher resources, fruits and roots and nuts and things like that, that Ikembo just couldn't get through because it had fairly um, slender jaws and teeth. So we think that uh, Afropithecus, this adaptation, this dietary adaptation in Afropithecus allowed it to disperse, to, to spread into other areas uh, further north in Africa. And eventually we have a very similar uh, genus uh, that's found in Saudi Arabia at about 17 and a half million years ago. And then shortly after that, at around 16 and a half to 17, we start finding apes with robust jaws, powerfully developed jaws, large teeth with thick, uh, thick layers of enamel on them. So these are apes that were again adapted to a broad range of diets with the capacity to eat the kinds of foods that Ikembo was not able to eat or even that chimpanzees are not able to eat. And those were the, the first apes to move into uh, Europe and Western Asia. We find them in Turkey and we find them in Germany first and then we find them in Austria after that. So these um, new kinds of apes uh, that evolved from Afropithecus, they, they're more modern looking in their dentition. Um, they have somewhat smaller canines. There are some subtle attributes that only people like me would really <laughs> look at, me and, and people like me, my colleagues. Uh, but it tells us that they were a little bit more modern in their teeth. And we have this kind of, this spread of this group, which we call loosely, we call them the Griffopiths, because the first genus name was Griffopithecus. Um, we find similar looking things in terms of the teeth anyway, in, as I mentioned, uh, in Germany, in Austria, in Turkey, in Anatolia, but also in Kenya. And so there's kind of a core group uh, north and south of the Mediterranean, or core area north and south of the Mediterranean, in which these apes evolved. And it was from that core group, and we're not sure if this the separation happened in Europe or Western Asia or in Africa, but somewhere in this core area, I should say, the ancestors of the orangutans, which are the Pongines, diverged from the ancestors of the African apes and humans, which are the hominines. And that divergence, wherever it happened, those two lineages ended up in different parts of Eurasia. Uh, the Pongines, of course, in Asia, uh, leading eventually to the living orangutans. And surprisingly, it appears that the African ape and human lineage, the hominines, rather than staying in Africa, they diverge uh, to, to, and separate from the orangs and start to proliferate and become abundant in Europe. We don't find them in Africa at all until much, much later in time. And that's really the basis for the you know, first part of the hypothesis, which is that the hominines diverged from the pongines, but they really take off and evolve uh, in Europe. And so that happens, and we, we get the earliest hominines, according to our research, other people have other interpretations. We get the earliest hominines at around 12 and a half million years ago, which is also the exact same time that we get the earliest pongines, which of course is what you would expect if they branched off, you know, they, they're the same age, right? They branched off from each other. They have the same length of evolution since their divergence. So that's nice that that corresponds. And these first hominines are, uh, thinly enameled, they go back to looking more like a Kembo, superficially anyway, and they have relatively thin enamel, relatively more slender jaws again. They were probably soft fruit eaters. And that's probably because in, in Europe, uh, in Europe especially at the time, it was a subtropical environment. It was a lush, humid area. There, were, uh, there was tropical vegetation with fruiting trees all year long. And so they didn't need the specialized adaptations to allow them, you know, to give them the dietary breadth that Afropithecus had that allowed it to disperse into, into Europe and Asia. Um, so they become these soft fruit frugivores uh, for the most part. 
But but the more important or the or just as important is that we see for the first time in these apes from Europe adaptations that look like modern ape adaptations for positional behavior, move posture and locomotion, which is that instead of being instead of walking on the tops of branches with their backbones horizontally oriented, they start to become more vertically oriented and look like apes. Apes have more vertical backbones and they suspend themselves below the branches as opposed to walking on the tops of branches. And that's what these guys were starting to do. And we know this because we have some good skeletons of apes from Spain and from Hungary. And they all have the hallmarks of a suspensory animal. They all have large hands with elongated fingers that are very strongly curved. Their backbones show signs of being vertically oriented. Their arms are long. They have specialized attributes of the shoulders. They have a whole bunch of things. And, and that's not really controversial to say that they were suspensory. So that happens. So we're becoming more like African apes. Um, and these animals, these apes thrive in Europe. They're found in abundance, really, in northeastern Spain, in, in, the, in Catalonia. In Hungary, there's a relatively new genus, Danuvius, that I had the pleasure of being involved in the analysis of, uh, from Germany. And there are other sporadic finds between Spain and Hungary, pretty much, until about 10 million years ago, nine and a, well, 10 million, let's say 10 million, that's pretty accurate. And then at around 10 million years ago, the climate starts to change. Well, it started to change a few million years earlier, but it finally caught up, caught up with the apes and they started to move south um, as the forests were giving way to more grassland areas. Grasslands like the, the Asian steppes of today. And the apes, we no longer find them after about nine and a half million years ago in most of Europe. Uh, what we're left with is um, a group of apes that has changed in its uh, in their uh, jaws and teeth, um, and they've uh, descended from uh, Western and Central Europe into Southeastern Europe, into the Balkan regions, um, and we find them mo mostly in um, Greece, but there are a couple of, there's one, actually several specimens now, from Bulgaria, and then of course the ones from Turkey that are a little bit later in time that we're going to get to. And these guys were adapted to more open country living, and they were probably forced into that from climatic changes that were occurring. And so we have a taxon, the best known taxon is called Oranopithecus, and it had very large jaws and, and big teeth with extremely thick enamel. So it was processing foods that were very hard and very tough, needed powerful chewing forces to, to break through the outer coverings of these things. They were probably on the ground a lot. They were probably uh, exploiting uh, resources like roots and rhizomes and things that have grit to them that are, you know, that have sand and, uh, and particles of, of, of dirt that would wear down their teeth, which is one of the reasons they had thick enamel so that their teeth would last longer. Um, so we think that they were more terrestrial, but unfortunately for those guys, we have almost no limb bones. For Oranopithecus, we literally have two finger bones. But even with just those two finger bones, we could say they're not very arboreal looking. They do look more terrestrial, but we don't know what kind of terrestrial animal they were. We don't. There's no indication that they were bipedal, but it's not impossible. They could have been quadrupedal like a monkey or like a baboon, for example, but they could have been a knuckle walker like a chimp. We just don't know because we don't have enough fossil evidence yet. We're really hoping to find more postcranial bones. And I think our site in Turkey is very promising for that. So we have a Rhinopithecus and it, it goes from about 9.5 to 9 million years ago. Um, and then, uh, we have the appearance of Anadoluvius, which is 8.7 million years old. Um, so it's a little bit younger than Oranopithecus. And it's a little different from uh, Oranopithecus in the structure of its jaws, 
Um, the, in details of its roots, the, the roots of the teeth are reduced. Um, so they're, they're not as, they don't have as many different roots for each tooth, particularly the premolars. Uh, the size of the roots is a, is a little bit different. The configuration of the roots changes in ways that look more like what we see in the earliest hominins, which is intriguing. Hominins are humans and our fossil ancestors since the divergence of the with the chimpanzees. So we get that with Anadoluvis. I'm not saying it's a hominin. I, I don't think it is. It's still a basal um, African ape. So before each of the lineages of the African apes and humans diverge from each other, we call that a stem African ape. So just imagine a tree with a stem and those are the common ancestors, and then the separate branches go off on their various directions. So that we call that a stem, a stem African ape, a stem hominin or African apes and humans. But you know we don't have as much material of Anadoluvius as we do of Aranopithecus. Uh, but what we do have tells us definitely that it was a hominin. Um, and you mentioned my recent trip to Turkey. During that trip. I found in the collection some limb bones. And I was mentioning we don't have a lot of limb bones from these things. Um, and so in the near future, in the next year or so, we hope to be able to analyze these limb bones and it will tell us more about how they were moving around and if they were moving around like, like modern African apes are or like humans, which I doubt, but it's possible, um, or like something else that doesn't exist today. So that's, that's Anna Deluvius. And then um, at about 7.2 million years ago, so there's a big gap of about one and a half million years, we pick up uh, the trace again of these hominines in, back in the Balkans, and this time in Greece, but in a different part of Greece from where Oranopithecus was found. Oranopithecus is from northern Greece, Macedonia part of Greece. This new thing, um, or this next tax on this next ape, which is called Graecopithecus, is from Athens, from Attica, for, further down south. And nothing to do in terms of the environment and even in terms of the geography and the animals that were living in the both places. Uh, it's completely different. It just happens that they're both in Greece, but they're really different faunal provinces. But we also have one, so we have a mandible of that, of, Graeco, of Graecopithecus, and we have a single premolar, an upper premolar, from Bulgaria that in 2017 we assigned to Graecopithecus also. And we did an analysis of Graecopithecus, the Graecopithecus mandible, which was has been known since, since World War II. It was actually discovered during the German occupation of, of Athens <laughs> during the Second World War. But we did a reanalysis of it, and, and we did some CAT scans, which means we were able to look inside the jaw. And we found that same interesting pattern of reduction in the number of roots and the size of the roots uh, and especially interesting was the size of the root for the canine tooth which is very small even though we think this was a male based on its size and that would imply a reduction in the size of the canine which is something that you only see in humans and our ancestors you do not see in living african apes so that's why the title of this um, publication in 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 uh, plus one was potential hominine ancestor. So we were being provocative a little bit and suggesting that there might have been an early human ancestor in the Balkans. But uh, I, it is a potential ancestor, and we really can't answer that question definitively until we get more fossils. Which is the reason that my other field area is going to be in those in the site in Bulgaria where that premolar was found. So that's what we have, and that's it in Europe. After 7.2, they disappear. Um, remember, though, that, that this is a time when the Mediterranean is shrinking in size, and it will eventually, only a million years or so later, it will be gone. It, it, the Mediterranean pretty much dries up. That's how dry and, and uh, the environment was. And it's at this time that lots of animals disperse from Western Asia and the Balkans into Africa. So giraffes, for example, we think of giraffes as African. They come from Asia. Um, rhinos, pigs, 
various kind, many kinds of antelopes, gazelles, spiral horn antelopes like impalas. Uh, the typical African fauna that we think of as, as African, much of that comes from Eurasia. And everybody is in agreement with that, pretty much. Not all of it, of course. Elephants are African, and there are lots of African, endemic African fauna. But a lot of, especially things like giraffes, everybody knows giraffes are African. Well, they're not. They're actually Asian. Basically, what we're saying with our hypothesis is that nothing special about the apes. They followed along with the pigs and the aardvarks and the giraffes and the rhinos into Africa. It's reasonable to propose that hominines um, dispersed from Eurasia back into Africa at about 7 million. And then it's at 7 million or so where we find the first possible uh, hominins, humans and their fossil ancestors in the form of Sahelanthropus at 7 or so, and then there were in at about 6 or so. In 2015, you worked on the analysis of a newly unearthed partial skull of a fossil ape and a Deluvius from Turkey. So how does this new discovery support the hypothesis that African hominins began their evolutionary journey in Miocene Europe? Well, uh, so Anna Deluvius, the, the face, the, the partial cranium that was the centerpiece of our recent paper, was found, as you said, in 2015, but I didn't get involved. I wasn't asked to be involved until about 2020. So it's about three years or so ago. It, it was the best preserved. It is the best preserved of a number of specimens that have been found starting in 2005 or so uh, of a, an, a very, very large ape that was originally described by a different group of researchers, although there's some overlap as a different, as another species of Oranopithecus. So nothing really special. Um, but then they found this face and they asked me to come and join the team and, and contribute to the analysis of this face. And together we decided that, um, I had to do a little bit of reconstructing of the face and I have uh, more experience than, than my colleagues in Turkey on working on apes because I've been doing it for 40 years and I've been fortunate enough to have found a number of crania. So I actually have of good experience in putting them back together. <laughs> and so I was able to do that. And once we saw the anatomy, we realized that it was different from Oranopithecus, not dramatically different, but different enough that it deserved to be uh, given a new genus name. Um, and it has, a, it has some subtle attributes that are more modern, more possibly hominin-like, so it does have smaller canines than Oranopithecus. I mentioned before that canine reduction is an important distinguishing attribute between hominins, which have small canines, and African apes that have large canines, the males in particular. And um, both the males and the females of Anadoluvius have relatively reduced canines. They have some other interesting subtle attributes of the teeth that also look a little bit more hominin-like, in particular in the premolars. So there are some important enough differences that we really needed to name a new genus. And right now, there isn't enough evidence to say that Anadoluvius is closer to humans than Oranopithecus, because we only have a few characters and it's not, it's not falling out with humans in our numerical analysis that we do or cladistic analysis. Um, but we're going to be, well, they're going to, they've invited me now to work in the field with them. We're going to be doing that starting next year. Um, and if we find some more fossils, it might help us to clarify the exact position uh, that Anna Deluvius occupies uh, within the, uh, the hominines, the African apes and humans. You mentioned that the landscape changed during the nine million years or so that the descendants of Afropithecus dwelled in Europe. Can you go into more detail about what exactly happened and how it spurred on further migrations? When apes first appear in Europe, to, when we first find them at 12, 12 and a half million, it was a time when uh, Europe had just peaked in terms of its humidity, this part of your Western and Central Europe, in terms of humidity and temperature. 
um, there was a there was a peak called the uh, uh, Miocene climactic optimum, <laughs> which is about 13, 13 and a half million years ago. And so this was a time when, I mean, it was already starting to get a little drier, but it was still quite humid. You have to imagine an environment that in many places was like the southeastern United States, was like Florida or Alabama or places like that, the Gulf states uh, of the U.S., that is. Um, so, you know, uh, mangrove ma vegetation, swampy uh, conditions in many places, big rivers, big braided streams with uh, heavy, heavily forested, um, heavy forests uh, following along uh, the rivers, not like tropical regions, not like the Amazon, for example, but uh, a subtropical uh, climate that was really conducive to the adaptations of many different kinds of animals, and in particular, apes. But, and we don't know why this is, um, or at least I don't know why this is, but progressively from following from the uh, middle Miocene climactic optimum onwards, it started to get drier. Um, and we have a transition from one kind of photosynthesis to a different kind of photosynthesis that is more prevalent in grasses. Uh, the grasses start to take over. They take over for the, uh, the forests or the forests are replaced from uh, subtropical vegetation that's evergreen uh, or mostly evergreen to uh, vegetation that's uh, predominantly deciduous. Increases in seasonality hotter hotter summers, colder winters, uh, rainy seasons, things like that. And so fruit becomes harder to find year around. Um, and we, again, we don't know why this happened, but there are, you know, throughout the history of the earth, there are, there are climatic cycles that it goes up and it goes down. Look at the, uh, the glaciers or glacial period was a dramatic example of that. So this happens and, um, Apes are good until about in Western and Central Europe until about nine million or so, even a little earlier than that. But eventually, as I mentioned before, they change in their adaptations. They become uh, more adapted to a more open country setting, still in forests, but more like woodlands rather than real forests, woodlands with patches of grass. And uh, that's those kinds of conditions were present in the Balkans and in Western uh, in Anatolia. And so that's where we find them next. A major part of your hypothesis is the exodus of those European ape descendants back into Africa millions of years after their forebears left it. So what do we know about this journey and what evidence has Africa given us that support it? Well, as I mentioned, uh, starting really starting at about 8 million or so, we start to see um, a migration or a dispersal of, of mammals from the western, uh, the eastern Mediterranean, the Balkans and, and southwestern Asia, into Africa, um, and we we have we know this because the earliest gazelles and giraffes and other things like that are found in in eastern Mediterranean region, and we find them very soon afterwards in North Africa and, and in East Africa. So we know the direction of this movement. Um, so that's, that is direct evidence from Africa that these different animals came from Eurasia because they're found later in, in Africa. And they're also more evolved and, you know, we know that the forms in Eurasia gave rise to the forms in, in Africa. That's not really in dispute. And so it would be the same thing with the apes, essentially. In terms of direct evidence of the apes, we don't really have any because, and, and that's maybe evidence that we're right because there are no uh, great apes in Africa, African apes, but even great apes um, in Africa uh, between 13 and a half million years ago when, you know, the apes that, um, that I described before that are members of this Griffopithecus core area. Um, uh, so before the divergence of, Gib of uh, orangs and African apes, uh, between 13.5 and 7 or, or so when we find Sahelanthropus, 
there's almost nothing. There's literally a handful of fossils. Um, they're not very informative. They've been interpreted by some to be hominins, to be African ape, in the African ape and human lineage. Many disagree, and I'm among them. Uh, primarily, well, for two reasons. One, they're so fragmentary. Two of the samples, two of the different species are known from a total of 15 teeth, isolated teeth. Uh, and one jaw fragment, and the other one's known from a single upper jaw fragment. There's just not enough, but what is there, there are many attributes that look more primitive, remind us of what came before rather than what came later. Um, so there's an absence, a total absence of evidence, and this is what, at the same time that we have dozens of sites in Europe and hundreds of fossils, literally. Uh, why so many in Europe and zero? in Africa unless they were never there. Um, and so th it's the absence of evidence that my colleagues will say is not evidence of absence. They just haven't been found yet. But for me, it's evidence that they weren't there because it's not like there are no, the, the sites are not known. There are dozens of, of sites of this time period in Africa as well, and not a single viable candidate for membership in the African ape and human lineage has been found. And so just to be clear, you're not saying that the human lineage, our lineage, began in Europe, right? Because I think there are some people out there who have already made that assumption. Yeah, unfortunately, that's the case. And I'm always having to clarify this. No, we're, we're talking about the ancestors of our common ancestor, really. So we're like, two degrees away from the earliest humans. So we're talking, again, to use that tree analogy, we're talking about the stem or the trunk and not about the branches. Um, the branches would be gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, and, and humans. And this is before that. So, and it is, it's important because people will and have uh, sometimes use this kind of research to claim that there's something special about Europe and that humans have always been in Europe and that's nonsense and that's not anything close to what we're we're saying so I'm glad that you asked me that so that I could clarify that now it's not to say that it's impossible that this that the branching the crown of the tree uh, some of it might have happened in Europe we don't know the oldest members of the African ape and human lineage that are accepted by most people as belonging to that lineage are from Africa, but we, but they're only humans. We don't have chimpanzees from that time period. We don't have gorillas from that time period. We only have hominins, which is kind of interesting, Sahelanthropus and Aurora. Um, so we don't really know exactly where that branching occurred, but it's more parsimonious. It's a simpler explanation to say the stem taxa moved down, the stem uh, ape, hominin moved down, and then branched off in Africa because that's where the branches live today. But it's not impossible that they independently move from Europe. It's not my first hypothesis, but it's something that I do keep in mind, in particular because there is some tantalizing evidence that I mentioned before with, with Graecopithecus. Uh, of some hominine uh, characters, especially the reduction in the canine size. And Graecopithecus is virtually just about the same age as Sahelanthropus. So, you know, it's not impossible that that's a hominine, but we really need to, we have a, a very poorly preserved mandible and one tooth from Bulgaria. We need more information uh, before we can really take that hypothesis very far along. Um, of course, there has been resistance to the whole idea that African apes and, and humans uh, appeared in, in Europe first because tradition, the traditional view is that it all happened in, in Africa. And since they're all in Africa now, it's just a simpler hypothesis to say, well, they've always been in Africa. But I, my response to that is, well, then how do you explain these very African ape looking things that are in Europe? And the frustrating thing is that most times people will say, oh, they're just side branches without really doing a detailed analysis. They'll just say they're side branches. I prefer the African origins hypothesis. There are some exceptions. There's one really good article, very thorough article that does the same kind of 
evolutionary analysis that we did, and that comes up with a, with a conclusion that's partly consistent with ours and partly not consistent with ours, because they find that things like Oranopithecus are in fact African ape and human lineage, belong to the African ape and human lineage, but other, the older ones, the thinner enameled ones, uh, do not. So it's, uh, it, it, we're sort of halfway there in a sense, but as people like me always say, we need more fossils, we need more evidence to test those competing hypotheses uh, further. And we especially need fossils from that time period in Africa, more sites in Africa to really show that the, the absence of apes between uh, 13 and 7 million years ago is because really because they weren't there and not because we just haven't found them yet. And what about future projects and new discoveries? Has anything else come to light recently that you can tell us about? Uh, <laughs> I have to be a little cautious here. There are some new fossils. One is uh, we're preparing a publication on a fossil from Bulgaria, but I really can't say much about it. But I think that if once it gets published, it will help us out somewhat with our understanding of Grecopithecus. And there are some new fossils from Anadiluvius as well that I think I alluded to before, especially the limb bones, which will help us to understand what Anadiluvius was doing. And especially, we think it was on the ground, but was it moving on the ground more like a monkey or moving more like a, an African ape, a knuckle-walking African ape? And if it was a knuckle-walking African ape, then that certainly lends greater strength to the idea that it belongs to that group of, of apes. Um, so working on new fossils, which is always a thrill, working on, uh, I, I mentioned that I was involved with the Danuvius project uh, from Germany. I'm still involved with that, very actively involved in that. We have some new material from Danuvius that's going to help us out, including what we think is actually a new genus of ape from uh, from that site. But again, can't say much about it right now. It's it, That's actually in revision. So that's been tentatively accepted. So that I'm hoping should come out before the end of the year. Well, that's exciting. And um, I have uh, various students working on projects. I, I worked for many, many years at a site called Rudabanya in Hungary. We still have quite a bit of material to analyze from there. That's something that's a high priority in my lab right now. In fact, I'm looking for interested grad students to continue with that work because there's a bit of a backlog. Um, I have uh, students working on really interesting projects involving uh, growth and development in, in the Western European apes. Uh, I just started a new project in collaboration with a, a friend of mine, a, a colleague uh, from Arkansas, Peter Unger, who's, who's probably the world's leading expert on diet and fossil apes. Uh, looking at the dietary adaptations of a wide range of fossil apes that I've analyzed over the years from Western and Central Europe. And actually, we're going to include the, the ones from the Balkans and from Anatolia as well. So there's lots of stuff going on in my lab. I'm looking forward to my sabbatical, which will start in July of 2024, um, when I'll be freer to do more traveling, to spend more time in the field. And... Uh, see what we can come, up, can come up with. Well, your research really is eye-opening and adds even more incredible branches to the evolutionary tree. And I'm very grateful that you've been able to take time out of your schedule to talk with us today. I will leave links to your books and research work in the description below. And hopefully we can have you back on the show one day in the very near future. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here. And I do look forward to uh, chatting with you again on your show. Um, but thank you also for doing the show because it's important for people like me, uh, evolutionary biologists in general, to have the support of people like you um, to promote the reality of, of evolution. <laughs>